Austro-Hungarian Emperor Franz Joseph has been on the imperial throne for a long time. In fact, among European monarchs in history, only Louis XIV had a longer reign. Franz Joseph came to power in 1848 and was pretty young at the time, having been born in 1830. And he has seen enormous changes in European culture, society, and industry. It was he, at the age of 83, whose declaration of war on Serbia, July 28, 1914, soon spiraled into this world war. And this week, Emperor Franz Joseph dies. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week at the Somme, the British captured Beaumont Hamel, Beaucourt, and Saint Pierre de Vion, despite the appalling weather. On the Macedonian front, the Five Nation Army neared Monastir. In Dobruja, the Russo Romanian forces made headway for a few days, but were stopped by midweek. And in the Transylvanian Mountains, the Germans broke through the Romanian lines. This is what came next. Well, there was a very big piece of news in the West as the Battle of the Somme, raging since July 1st, came to an end as winter arrived on the front. The night of the 18th was the final assault of the campaign, an Allied advance of a thousand meters on the Ankler River in the mud and snow. One of the men there, Lieutenant Colonel Bernard Freiburg, was awarded the Victoria Cross for his bravery, and the official history of the 29th Division says that his initiative and leadership were responsible for winning the Battle of the Anchor, the last sub-battle of the whole big battle. But he had been wounded in the head, and he looked so bad that he was put in the tent with those who were expected to die, and given no medical help except painkillers. Later on, he heard a voice telling people to move him to the tent where you were expected to live, and he got help. Later, though, he couldn't find out who gave that order. But 25 years later, in a hotel lobby in Cairo, he thought he heard the same voice again and asked the guy if he had been on the anchor in 1916. It was indeed the man who'd saved him, Captain S.S. Greaves. Anyhow, as the Somme ended, each side made plans for new offensives for 1917, in spite of the enormous toll in deaths, wounded, missing, and men lost as prisoners. Robin Pryor and Trevor Wilson in the Somme claim that one out of every two British soldiers who fought at the Somme either died or were so wounded that they never fought again. They give figures of roughly half German total casualties for those of the Allies, but estimates vary considerably in different sources. Martin Gilbert estimates the death tolls at the Somme as 146,404 for the British and French and 164,055 for the Germans. But if you add all of the casualties together, the wounded, missing, and prisoners, the numbers climb to over a million total men casualties for the battle. And just FYI, when the battle ended, the British were still five kilometers short of reaching Bapaum, which had been the first day's objective on July 1st. The death toll at the Battle of Verdun, which was limping slowly towards its conclusion after nine months of fighting, was estimated by Gilbert of being over 600,000 total by this point, though many estimates make that number as the total number of casualties. But if Gilbert is correct, then that is a death toll of a million men for the two battles so far, which, if you choose to divide it over a five-month period, works out to 277 dead men per hour, or nearly five dead men every minute, 24 hours a day. A great many of those men lost their lives to the machine gun, and a footnote in machine gun history happened this week when Sir Hiram Maxim, its inventor, died on November 24th. But this was far from the biggest celebrity death this week. On November 18th, Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph had expressed keen satisfaction that there was talk of peace going around. On the 20th, even though he was suffering with bronchitis, he still went to work on his official files and before bed asked to be woken at 3.30 in the morning. He was and went to work again. But just after nine that evening, the emperor died. The new emperor of Austria and king of Hungary was his great nephew, Archduke Karl, age 29. The death of Franz Joseph was, of course, a great shock to his empire. He had often in his life been credited with personally holding the empire together. His son was a different sort of man from a different world. He had been an active army officer, at one point a corps commander on the Italian front,
but he was anti-war. Also, his wife was Italian and had Entente sympathy, so there was deep concern in the army's high command. The first reports that Karl received as emperor were of the situation in Romania, where a central power's victory and conquest looked like it was in the cards. After the Germans broke through at Targu Jiu last week, Romanian general Parashi Vasilescu wanted to abandon the region west of the Olt River to make his defense along the river itself. But his decision was countermanded by King Ferdinand at the request of French Major General Henri Matthias Bertelot. Bertelot had been invited to Romania after the traumatic loss of Tertukaya as an experienced liaison officer. He had even been offered the job of Chief of Staff of the Romanian Army, but had declined. Anyhow, his and Ferdinand's decision was pretty much a death sentence for the men that were ordered to fight to the last man, but it had a purpose. The East-West Railway across Romania met at Orsova, another line coming from Timisoara in Hungary. Those railways would be vital for the Central Powers to supply troops south of the Transylvanian Alps. Leaving those men behind to destroy the railway and the bridges would buy time for Romania to get some reserve troops in place. Still, by the 19th, Vasilescu wrote the king that his men no longer were able to fight the enemy in western Wallachia, and they were retreating. The Germans and Austrians were advancing 40 kilometers a day in spite of the snow, ice, and fog, and on November 21st, they occupied Craiova, capital of western Wallachia. By nightfall, they were closing in on the Alt. Meanwhile, 320 kilometers to the south, Field Marshal August von Mackensen's forces began crossing the Danube the 23rd, and as the week ended and Austrian engineers completed their new bridge, traffic bringing heavy artillery across the Danube commenced. But if the Central Powers were on the move in Romania, it was the Allies in the Balkans. On the 18th, the Germans and Bulgarians evacuated Monastir, and the following day, French, Serbian, and Russian troops entered the city. French General Maurice Sorel and Serbian Crown Prince Alexander came up to Monastir the 21st to congratulate the troops. The Bulgarians and Germans, for their part, seeing that though they had been driven from Monastir, their enemy was too weak to really pursue, dropped proclamations by airplane on the town that read, People of Monastir, be of good heart. We shall not shell you or bomb you, for we are coming to retake your city. Here's a side note, courtesy of Martin Gilbert. The French cavalry officer who entered the town at the head of a Russo-French division was one Captain Murat, a descendant of Napoleon's marshal who entered Moscow in 1812. Also, the 19th was four years to the day since the Serbs had taken Monastir from the Ottomans during the First Balkan War. And here are some notes to end the week. On the 21st, the ocean liner Britannic was torpedoed and sunk in the Aegean. It was being used as a hospital ship. Only 30 of the over 1,000 passengers died, but one of the survivors was a woman who had also survived the sinking of the Britannic sister ship, the Titanic, four years ago. The Britannic was the largest ship sunk during World War I. Its wreck was discovered by Jacques Cousteau in 1975. On November 20th, Arthur Zimmermann becomes the new German foreign minister. On the 23rd, the Greek provisional government under Eleftherios Venizelos declares war on Germany and Bulgaria. And on the 24th, Alexander Tripov, a conservative very much opposed to the influence of Rasputin on Russian politics, became Russia's prime minister. And a very busy week of war ends. Monastir falls to the Entente. Western Wallachia falls to the Central Powers, and they also begin crossing the Danube, heading for Bucharest. The Titanic Britannic is sunk. There are political appointments on both sides, and the Battle of the Somme comes to an end. That battle is one of the three bloodiest battles in world history up to this point, and all three of them were fought this year, at one point simultaneously, in a war that began when Franz Joseph declared war on Serbia. Now, he died this week, a hundred years ago, and Karl came to power. I read that Karl was anti-war, but at this point in time, how could he not be? If you'd like to learn more about the long reign of Emperor Franz Joseph, you can click right here for our special about that. Our Patreon supporter of the week is the Canadian in Michigan. All right. 
Well, please support us on Patreon to make this show better and better because every dollar really does count. You can also subscribe to our subreddit and meet our fantastic community over there. See you next time.